now like to invite Dr. Julia Kopp from Germany. She is the world's leading independent consultant on sludge dewatering and wastewater management and has handled close to 800 installations across uh, Germany. So I hand it over to you, Dr. Kopp, for your session. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So um, you can see my slides now? I hope so. So my speech today is about why the water reliability is decided by upstream treatment process. Um, first of all, I give you an uh, overview about uh, who I am. So my name is Julia Kopp. I'm an independent and that's a bit special by government certified technical expert on CO sludge treatment. This is the address of my company. I, I'm a civil engineer and I do my PhD work. Afterwards, um, I start my consulting and um, um, be independent since 2006. And I do a lot of work in, the, in expert groups. I do a lot of dewatering projects and dewatering measurements. And uh, yes, I'm, I have three adult children. So now we can start on. The content is, I have six topics. The first topic is mechanical dewatering. So um, then water binding in sewer sludge. So we talk about sludge dewatering, but we have to talk about water in sludge, the role of waste activated sludge in wastewater treatment, especially on sludge. I'm not sure. I can't. I'm. I'm not sure if I. If you see my slides, but perhaps somebody helps me. Uh, uh, Dr. Kopp, can you please uh, share your screen at the bottom thing with the PowerPoint slides, please? Thank you. Uh, but there's a green button no, at the bottom. Uh, to share then that, that I have a, a mistake. They tell me I can't do because another one did. So perhaps I tried. I was sharing it. I was sharing it. So now you can see it? Yes. Yes. Fine. So once more, content. We start with mechanical dewatering. And then if we talk about dewatering, the result is a DS and cake. But to understand dewatering, you have to talk about water binding. The main influence on dewatering and water binding is the waste activated sludge itself, and especially how much phosphate is in interaction. And at least I will show you how to optimize dewaterability and some conclusions. So mechanical dewatering. The mechanical dewatering is a centerpiece of biologists biosolid processing. That means you reduce the volume and the mass of sludge that had to be hauled away. If you use a mechanical dewatering device in dependence on the sludge characteristics, you can achieve 15 to 35 of dried solid in cake. But the main influence is the voice activated sludge. I would like to introduce you in this topic. Uh, no dewatering without chemical conditioning, but this is not topic of the speech today. It will be a topic of the speech in uh, four weeks. Which devices are suitable for mechanical dewatering on wastewater treatment plants? So you can use centrifugation or filtration. Most common is belt filter presses, crew presses, or centrifuge. So here you see a flow chart of a um, wastewater treatment plant, and we talk about this piece the mechanical dewatering in the end of the process. And the characteristics of a mechanical dewatering or the dried solid you could achieve is related to the amount between the primary sludge and the waste activated sludge. The primary sludge is related to the retention time in the primary clarifier. Primary sludge is very fibrous. You have small particle, easy to degrade and that's not a troublemaker, but if you have a short retention time in your primary clarifier, you get more waste activated sludge. And waste activated sludge is mostly restricted to bacteria and it's more jelly-like, water binding is quite high and uh, therefore it's important to understand sludge dewatering. So now we start about this dewatering itself. I just say, if you talk about sludge dewatering, you have to talk about the water binding. Even after dewatering and you have 25% dried solid in your sludge cake, uh, you have 27%, 75% um, of water. So what is the rule of water in sludge dewatering? 
Here you see a microscopic picture of a CO slot. And you can see different parts of water in relation to the physical bonding. So you see here this part, the picture is in the um, black screen. That means the water is black and the particles are light. The, this area, this part of water has no relation to the sludge particle. This could be separated by mechanical forces. The most interesting part of water is the interstitial water. This is captured inside the sludge particles itself. The surface water is bound by at hazard forces and uh, you have chemical bound in intercellular water. The binding is so strict, it's not, you're not able um, to release it by mechanical forces. So the flux structure itself is the dewatering signature of a sewage sludge. We take this particle in a belt filter press to understand why only the free water can be separated. So this particle is here. You have a belt filter press, you increase the pressure, and the particle here is the same than here. And in this phase, you have only particles and the water inside the sludge particles. And this water will remain, and therefore the structure of your particles describe the dewaterability itself. Um, we we work on a measuring system since 20 years, how to determine the free water content. The idea is quite easy to get good results. It's not so easy. So what we are doing is we dry sludge very, very slowly on a very certain conditioning by thermogravimetric measurements. So the drying curve starts here. Here you have the moisture content and this is a drying rate. You see it's quite low. The sludge drying, 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 drying up to an end. And the part and the, where the free water was evaporated, you have no water binding, you can describe the drying curve with a line. The moment all free water is released, the capillary forces slow down the drying process and the curve and the line divided. So at this point we mark make as R and you can calculate the dried solid content after separation or free water. So the DSA, the DS at point A of this drying curve marks the maximum DS by mechanical dewatering. We have a five point calibration. The accuracy is quite high and it's used to check guarantee values. It's accepted by courts, so you're measuring DSA and you get exactly the dried solid content you achieve in full scale tests. This is a really nice tool to describe dewaterability. So now three slides about the watering device itself. One very common dewatering device is a belt filter press. You have three zones. In the first zone, you give the conditioning sludge onto the belt. It's a thickening process. So approximately 70% of thickening has to be finished here. Then the second belt comes on the sludge cake. So you have to be careful that no sludge screech out of these belts. And in the last part, you increase the pressure, um, you get smaller rolls and shear stresses, and for a longer time under pressure, you get more water out. The state of technology for bulk filter presses is release only the most of the free water, so you could achieve DS, the maximum less 2% DS points. One hint and comment to the feeding of the filter presses as, um, so if you see here, this is an overfeeding. You have no time that the water could release. And the good operation is about 60% of the max rated value. So if you sell a belt filter press for 40 cubic per hour, you can use it in a good way with 20. The same for screw presses. Screw presses are similar to belt filter presses, but the belt the, the filter is outside, so we have here to see the filter, the incoming sludge comes in here, will be transported to a cone and squeezed out. They, they work very slowly and it has a long retention time. Sometimes they have trouble with a good capture rate, so they are really suitable for very small treatment plants, quite easy to handle, but you can only release a, um, nearly all free water, that means the S less 2% is the maximum you could achieve. And you can operate it as a 
about 50% of the max weighted value. Most common are the use of centrifuge. So the incoming sludge will be conditioning inside this pipe, will be throw out on the bowl, will be transported by um, the screw to this direction and the water flows out here. The operation of the centrifuge is uh, related to the torque. That means the power you need to bring out the sludge of this uh, bowl. And with increasing torque, you get bet increasing torque, you get better dewatering results up to a certain point. Afterwards, the shear stresses are so high that all flocks will be destroyed, the capture rate goes down and the acid cake too. So state of technology, if you have a big one, more than 15 cubic per hour, you can release all free water and you can operate at optimum about approximately 60% of the max rated value. If it is too small, you lose performance. But now we talk about the sludge itself. You see, the state of technology is you can achieve, you can release mostly of the free water and the amount of free water is related to the sludge characteristics itself. So if you use another unit, you will get the same result because the flock structure determines the dewaterability. The role of force in the sludge feed. This is a takeaway knowledge. The flock structure is a signature um, for the dewaterability of a sewer sludge. Here you see two examples. The left hand side, you see this is a sewer sludge after the anaerobic digestion, the particles are quite small, the amount of water kept inside the particles is as small as well, and you achieve about 30% DS and cake. That's very fine. This is another municipal uh, sludge from a wastewater treatment plant, also anaerobic digestion, and they only achieve 20% dry solid. And the difference between those both is they have a big primary settling tank and let's see, that means less amount of waste activated sludge and they make a phosphorus precipitation and this wastewater treatment plant has a really small primary sedimentation and enhanced biologic pre removal and the part, part of the incoming wastewater comes from a diary. So at the origin of the sludge, if you have a primary sludge, you have a low colloidal structure. And if you have a biological sludge, you have a high colloidal nature. That means all your particles are more like jelly-like um, structures. Um, we create a model to describe the waterability is published in the Biosolid Conference last year and will be explained on WebTech in, uh, in autumn too. And you can see here the DS after dewatering. It's related to the waste freight ratio of the incoming raw sludge before digestion. So if you have only waste activated sludge, your dewaterability is quite low. If you have only primary sludge, your dewaterability is quite fine. There's an influence of the digested sludge on VSS2, but the main influence of your dewatering is the amount of waste activated sludge in your digested sludge. And notice the short primary clarification time means you'd produce more waste activated sludge and therefore you will get lower dewatering results. The influence of the volatile suspended solid is given for one sludge system, but if you compare different sludges with different volatile suspended solids due to the cake you could achieve, you see the data scattering very, very, very uh, worse. And therefore you can say the VSS is not a guarantee value for the watering device. The influence on the waste fraction or phosphorus removal is much, much, much more important than the VSS of your sludge itself. And if you talk about the wars, also cool. we can remember the wars is the main topic for dewatering because these are the jelly like flops. But to describe the wars more exactly, you have to ask about the sludge age, 
for example, if you have a young sludge, you have a poor suitability, very, very small flocks. If you have a good sludge age, about 14 days, something like this in a biological tank, it will be okay. If the sludge age is too high, they get hungry, they have nothing to eat, they, they have a poor sludge flock structure and the produce of EPS, that's a big problem. And um, EPS increase the water binding of a waste activated sludge. So you can see here, um, this is a example from a wastewater treatment plant from Switzerland. In the beginning of 2000, they implement dinitrification. Therefore, they shorten the primary settling tank and increase sludge age. So you see the dinitrification process is uh, coming up and the dewaterability is going down due to the fact that the sludge is very old or older and uh, the amount of wars in relation to the whole sludge, the whole raw sludge incoming in digestion is higher. So we talk about sludge and about the characterization of the wars. And one of the main topic to characterize the waste activated sludge itself is the rule of phosphate. Um, here you see a picture, a microscopic picture um, about the sludge flock. And we stain all EPS with a um, ruthenium red, it's a color. And you see all these jelly-like structure on site the sludge particles. And, the, and these color, these product, you call EPS. Um, EPS is a polysaccharide, it's a polyprotein. It covered the whole surface, it's about 30%, 35% of the bacteria mass at all. Um, these macromolecules affected negatively the sludge dewatering behavior. And the role of phosphate and due to these EPS is they unfold the EPS and therefore more water could be bind. For example, a butcher used phosphate to increase the water binding of sausages and you have the same effect on the proteins in your sweet sludge. So we did a lot of measurings of the D acid cake in relation to the phosphate we measure in the sludge and you can see with increasing amount of phosphate, the dewaterability reduced. The amount of water an EPS can bound is a five times higher than their own mass. And therefore, the amount of EPS and protein is influenced by phosphate as well and have a high value. So if you have a wastewater treatment plant with phosphorus precipitation, you get quite good dewatering results, about 29% dried solid, and you use 10 kilo of polymer per ton. And uh, if you have an enhanced biological pre-removal, you're measuring higher phosphate concentration and digested sludge. The dewaterability is about 4% less, 25, and you need about three kilo more polymer. The takeaway knowledge to this point is the main influence on sludge dewatering is relation between waste activated sludge and primary sludge. So if you see a primary sludge could be at least dewatered up to 30, 34% and a waste activated sludge, the dewatering is limited around 20, 20 19 to 20%. So with increasing, um, gay, um, increasing wastewater treatment, nitrogen removal, biological pre-removal, you need to short up your clarification time to get BOD into the second biological step. So, and remember, short primary clarification time, you produce more waste activated sludge. And if you combine these with high phosphate concentration, um, the dewatering results will be um, reduced and you can indicate a phosphorus biological peer removal if you measure phosphate concentration higher than 100 milligram per liter autophosphate in anaerobic digested sludge. At least you have an influence of the volatile suspended solids. Volatile suspended solids bind more water than inorganic particles, but this influence is minor to the both um, interaction, that means the inter influence of the waste activated sludge on the water binding and the interactions between the EPS and the water binding by phosphate. So please, please, please don't use a volatile suspended solid for check your guarantee values. 
how to optimize your sludge characteristic, you have to change the water binding of your waste activated sludge. In other words, if you look to new process which change, which, they, which are um, successful in the market, they, they work in two ways. First, um, you make an attack on the phosphate, so you make a precipitation, for example, by struvite. I will tell something more in the last seminar to this topic, or you change the proteins. And that is quite easy. If you change the proteins by thermal treatment, for example, you have your neck, and this is the protein and water binding of this protein by denaturation on temperature, you will break it up you will change and you get a water release. And the, the trick about the THP is you do it before anaerobic digestion. You can easily degrade this di uh, proteins in digestion. So you have less proteins by better degree of degradation in anaerobic treatment, and you have a lower water binding, and therefore you get better dewater results. Some examples. Really easy is the thermal chemical treatment of waste activated sludge, for example, by the Ponder system. It's quite common in Germany, a few examples in US as well. You use the excess heat of your um, uh, biogas machines. So the primary sludge go into the digestion. The waste activated sludge will be added with caustic soda, about two liters per cubic meters. You bring it up in a heat exchanger up to 65 degrees Celsius. You have a retention time in the system in this one about two hours and you feed it into the digestion. If you look to the, if you compare the results with this chemical um, thermal treatment, you achieve 4% higher dried solid in such. Another example uh, from a wastewater treatment plant in Germany, it's close to Munich. They use it for a couple of times. After that, they change system to solid stream. That's perhaps something Bill will explain. So they make a pre-cooking of the waste activated sludge with steam. Uh, they make a pre-dewatering. Um, the reaction of temperature will be 30 minutes at 150 to 165 degrees Celsius. You quick cool down your sludge with the primary sludge. You make a digestion. If, if you compare the dewatering results without DHP and with DHP, you have an increase about 7% DS points in cake. That's a big, big, big improvement. And Cumbi is well known in UK. Um, and there are one treatment plant, we make some examinations. The THP treatment is about waste activated and primary sludge, and therefore the effect is much bigger. Um, you have a change in the degree of degradation. You need a really short retention time. You have a high biogas production. You get quite high results in DS of cake. Of course, you have a change in your return load, but last but not least, you will be able to improve your dewatering results up to 10% dried solid points. So some conclusion to the final end. The flock structure is the dewatering signature of your sewage sludge. Take a look through your microscope to get an idea about sludge rewatering itself. The flock structure and the water binding is mainly influenced by the amount of waste activated sludge. And to characterize these waste activated sludge, you have to look to the phosphates and the water interaction with the EPS or the sludge age itself. So if you have a short primary clarification time, you have more waste activated sludge, this will reduce the dewaterability. And if you use an enhanced biological pre remover, you have you need more polymer and you have a less dewaterability. So it sounds so easy, but to clean up the water is the first aim. So you have to adjust your wastewater treatment to your regulation to the wastewater um, process. And afterwards, you have this big amount of waste activated sludge. But you can handle it if you treat your sludge and treat the waste activated sludge. So you use the water binding um, by phosphor precipitation. Um, or you make a denaturation of the EPS by using heat or heat and chemicals. So if you make a combination about heat, about
about 75, 60 degrees Celsius with caustic soda, you can increase the dried solid content up to 4%. If you use a thermal treatment, for example, by Cumbi, by with steam or in heat exchanger, only for the waste activated sludge, you could increase your dried solid content up to 7%. So that's the heat uh, level is higher, 150, 165 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes. And if you make the thermal treatment for both sludges primarily as well as waste activated sludge, you could increase the process up to 10% dried solids. Okay, if you change something in your sludge treatment, you can be sure you have to change something afterwards. You have to check the polymer, you need other polymer, you have to take in consideration that the return flow um, is changed too, but it's you can handle it. So, and at least if you use the Stuart precipitation, you can improve your sludge cake as well, 4% dried solid on top. And that's really interesting. You can combine the Stuart precipitation after digestion with the THP before digestion, and therefore you can manage your sludge dewatering process. We did a lot of tests to check this in advance before you build a full-scale process. So if you're interested in something like this, um, you find our address on the web page. Thank you for listening. Uh, Kailash, uh, you're probably on mute. Uh, thank you, Dr. Julia, uh, for you know sharing this presentation.